In this lesson, we will examine how the royal status God gave all of humanity was mocked, how the institution of marriage and the begetting of children were subjected to prophets, how holy sex within marriage was replaced with rape of the enslaved woman, and how the family structure of the enslaved lasted only as long as they were not sold. We will look at how the sin of racism hobbled human flourishing and harmed the common good. Why are we talking about chattel slavery and racism now? None of us were alive back then and did not participate in those evils. In 2001, the Pontifical Commission on Justice and Peace addressed this very question. There are situations where the evil done survives the person who has done it. The evil survives through the consequences of certain actions. The evil can become a burden weighing on the conscience and memory of later generations. The evil of racism is a stain that requires identification and effort to wash it out of the fabric of society. What do I mean by racism? By racism, I mean the attitudes, practices, customs, cultural representations, and laws and systems that condition society to believe that only some people of a particular race are worthy of dignity and respect, and others are inferior. As a result of these beliefs and corresponding actions, the human flourishing of the targeted group is undercut. Slavery was common throughout antiquity, and Africans sold other Africans into slavery. Shouldn't we blame them instead? Sin has been with us since the beginning of humanity. Unjust and discriminatory behavior can be found in the history of earlier major civilizations, but not racism, as I previously defined it. The difference between slaves of ancient times and those persons ensnared in chattel slavery is that the former were enslaved because they were conquered in war. They were not persons despised because of their race. Europeans developed racist theories in their encounter with what they called the New World to justify dispossessing Native people of their land and to reduce them, and later Black people, to slavery for financial gain. It is this particular cooperation with the lies of the devil regarding the person that harmed the human family. For if we are bound in a common humanity and equal dignity, we are all harmed by racism, which tries to sever that bond. The purpose of this discussion isn't to blame, but to liberate us from the demonic influence of racism. Remember, God gave us all a royal status when he created humankind in his image and likeness. Through the lure of evil, we told God that we knew better. We no longer acknowledge the crown he gave to all of humanity. We fashioned our own based on race and denied it to those persons deemed inferior and deemed suitable only for hereditary slavery for life. The racist thinking was that black persons were unfit for a royal status, if you will. The colonial laws conditioned the populace to believe these lies, while attitudes and customs further reinforced the racial hierarchy. In practice, in a slave society, the human family on account of race has no common bond nor shared equality with whites as made in the image of God. What evil was unleashed upon our land? Douglas Blackman, in his book, Slavery by Another Name, writes, many in colonial America were perplexed by the concept of categorizing humans by race and skin color versus the longstanding European tradition of identification rooted in nationality and place of origin. Dispelling that confusion and ensuring the dominant position of whites in general, colonial legislatures, especially in Virginia, South Carolina, and later Georgia, began in the 1650s to systematically define residents by color and lineage. The intentions were twofold. To create the legal structure necessary for building an economy with cheap slave labor as its foundation, and secondly, to reconcile bondage with America's revolutionary ideals of intrinsic human rights. Blackman continues, 
Blacks could be excluded from the concepts that every man was granted by God, individual freedom, and a right to the pursuit of happiness because colonial laws codified a less than fully human status of any person carrying even a trace of black blood. Instead of embracing the concept that regardless of color, all men are created equal with no king or prince born to higher status than any other, colonial leaders extended a version of royal status for all whites. Through this abuse of law, the profound, inherent, equal dignity of the enslaved black person was disregarded. The enslaved person had no legal marriage rights. And if the enslaved married freely, it was done in secret and had no legal standing. What is a right and exclusive within a marriage between a man and a woman was denied the enslaved person. Enslaved black women were bought not only for physical labor, but also for sexual slavery. Some women were forced into arrangements to breed the strongest stock for the person who enslaved them. Their children were not their own and could be sold at any time. Enslaved black women, along with any of their future progeny, could be bequeathed in wills to the deceased slaver's descendants. The enslaved person could be sold to settle debts or lost bets or hired out to make money for the slaver. If the slavers severely punished the enslaved person with the lash, the victim had no legal recourse. In 1669, the Virginia Assembly enacted a law stating that if a slave is killed as a result of resisting his master or anyone sent by the master to correct the slave, that the killing was not a felony. The statute reads, an act about the casual killing of slaves. Be it enacted and declared by this grand assembly, if any slave resists his master or other by his master's order correcting him, and by the extremity of the correction should chance to die, that his death shall not be a compted felony but the master or that other person appointed by the master to punish him be acquit from molestation, since it cannot be presumed that propensed malice, which alone makes murder a felony, should induce any man to destroy his own estate. In short, the law states that premeditated malice necessary for murder cannot be formed against one's own property. If a slave were beaten to death under certain conditions, the slaver would be compensated. Although we have no real power to strip a person of the dignity God gave them, racism and slavery together mocked God's power by setting up its own earthly systems for bequeathing dignity or depriving others of it. The Federal Writers Project a New Deal era program created to provide work for journalists and writers led to the production of slave narratives, which are first person accounts of those who experienced slavery. In reading some of these slave narratives, I found various accounts of the horrors of slave life. I think hearing these first person accounts helps us grasp the reality of the life of the enslaved person and gives us a glimpse of the grave evil done to the human family. These accounts were written in the 1930s, which may be in the lifetime of some of our living family members. Here are a few excerpts, which I have shortened and lightly edited using modern language where necessary for the sake of clarity. Annalisa Foster, age 68, Raleigh, North Carolina. Both of my parents' owners were mean to the slaves and did not care much if they killed one because they had plenty. There was one woman that I heard my mama tell of being beat clean to death. The woman was pregnant and she fainted in the field at the plow. The slave driver said she was faking, she ought to be beaten. The master said she can be beat, but don't hurt the baby. The driver says he won't hurt the baby. And then he digs a hole in the sand and puts the woman in a hole, which was about up to her armpits. He then ties her up and straps her hands over her head. He takes the long bull whip and he cuts long gashes all over her shoulders and raised arms. 
Then he walks off and leaves her there for an hour in the hot sun. The flies and the gnats harass her, and the sun hurts too, and she cries. Then the slave driver comes out with a pan full of vinegar, salt, and red pepper, and he washes the gashes. The woman faints. He digs her up, and in a few minutes, she is dead. Georgia Anna Foster, age 76, Raleigh, North Carolina. We lived in a little log house at Masters. The food was short and things in general were bad. My mother told me there were a whole lot meaner than they had any business being. They allowed patrollers to snoop around and whip the slaves. My mother said they stripped some of the slaves naked and whipped them. She said women had to work all day in the fields and come home and do the housework at night while the white folks barely did a hand turn of work. Martha Allen, age 78, Raleigh, North Carolina. My mother belonged to Tom Edward Gaskin, and she wasn't half fed. The cook nursed the babies while she cooked so that the mothers could work in the field, and all the mothers did was stick the babies in the kitchen door on their way to the fields. I heard mama say they went to work without breakfast and that when she put her baby in the kitchen, she would go by the slop bucket and drink from it. The slave master was as bad as he could be, and the slaves got awful beatings. The young master sort of wanted my mama, but she told him no. So he cut a knot of wood and hit her in the head with it. These white men that had babies by these Negro women were called carpet getters. My father's father was one of those white men. I remember that the Ku Klux Klan used to go to the free issue houses, strip all the family and whip the old folks. Then they would make the pretty yellow girls dance with them and go to bed with them. That's what the Klan was, a bunch of mean men. Cornelia Andrews, age 87, Smithfield, North Carolina. Me and my mama and some of the rest of the slaves were sold to Dr. McKay Vadden, who was not good to us, Dr. Vadden owned a good-sized plantation, but he had just eight slaves. We had plank houses, but we did not have much food and clothes. We wore shoes with wooden bottoms in the winter and no shoes in the summer. They said that way before I was born, they used to strip the slaves stark naked and gallop them over to the square in Smithfield so that the buyers could see that they weren't scarred nor deformed. While I could remember, they'd sell the mothers away from the babies, and there wasn't any crying about it where the master would know about it neither. Why? Well, they'd get, get beat black and blue, that's why. Was I ever beat bad? No, no ma'am, I wasn't. Here, the daughter, a graduate of Cornell University who was in the room listening, came forward. Open your shirt, mammy, and let the lady judge for herself. The old lady's eyes flashed as she sat bolt upright. She seemed ashamed, but the daughter took the shirt off, exposing the back and shoulders, which were marked as though branded with a plaited cowhide whip. There was no doubt of that at all. I was whipped publicly, she said tonelessly, for breaking dishes and being slow. I was in the kitchen washing dishes and I dropped one. The missus called Mr. Blunt King, a patroller, and he pits the whipping you see the marks of on me. A friend of the interviewer who was present remarked, that must have been horrible to say the least. You don't know nothing, the old woman blazed. Alex Heath, a slave, was beat to death here in Smithfield. He was sentenced to death for stealing, and they decided to beat him to death. They gave him 100 lashes for nine mornings straight, and on the ninth morning, he died. My uncle Daniel Sanders was beat till he was cut into gashes, and he was beat to death like Alex was. But one day, after they had beat him and thrown him back in jail without a shirt, he broke out and ran away. He went down in the river swamp, and the blowflies blowed the gashes on his back, and he fell unconscious. A white man found him and took him home with him. He died two to three months after that, and he never could get his body straight, nor walk without a stick. He could just drag. And you know, they didn't let no little renty slaves have children. Nah, sir, they ain't. They operate on them like they do the male hog, so they can't have any little runty children. <laughs>
Fanny Kennedy, age 79. Master Jordan was hard on his slaves. He worked them overtime and didn't give them enough to eat. They didn't have good clothes, neither, and their shoes were made out of wood. The children didn't have any shoes at all. They went barefooted in the snow and ice, same as in the summertime. I never had any shoes on my feet until I was well past 10 years old, and that was after we were set free. I was sort of scared of Miss Polly, too. She was nice when Master Jordan wasn't around. But when he was around, she was a yes sir woman and did whatever he told her to do. He made her slap my mama one time because when mama passed his coffee, she spilt some in the saucer. Miss Sally hit mammy easy, but Master Jordan say, hit her Sally, like she deserved to be hit. Then Miss Sally draw back her hand and hit my mama in the face, pow! Then she went back to her place at the table. Maddie Curtis age 98, Raleigh, North Carolina. Preacher Whitfield, being a preacher, was supposed to be good, but he didn't have feed nor clothe his slaves, and he whipped them bad. I've seen him whip my mama with all the clothes off her back. He'd buck her down on a barrel and beat the blood out of her. We didn't have any sociables, but we went to church on Sunday, and they preached to us that we'd go to hell alive if we sassed our white folks. I went as naked as your hand till I was 14 years old. I was naked like that when my nature come to me. Master Whitfield didn't care. But after that, my mama told him that I had to have clothes. In some of the accounts, references are made to patrollers. Slave patrols were an aspect of social control for the enslaved black person. According to the National Law Enforcement Museum, Slave patrols were one of the earliest and most prolific forms of early policing in the South dedicated to controlling and monitoring the enslaved populations. According to historian Gary Potter, slave patrols served three main functions. One, to chase down, apprehend, and return to their owners runaway slaves. Two, to provide a form of organized terror to deter slave revolts, and three, to maintain a form of discipline for slave workers who were subject to summary justice outside the law. There were many kinds of social controls forced upon the enslaved African-American population in the South. These controls used both physical and psychological tactics, including an overseer's brutal whip, the intentional breakup of families, deprivation of food and other necessities, and the private employment of slave catchers to track down runaways. Slave patrols, likewise, carried out this role of violent control of African Americans. The difference, however, from other forms of organized policing was that these patrols were legally required to fill this role. In fact, patrollers could be fined for failing to carry out this civic duty, which included beating and terrorizing enslaved persons. Slave patrol routines included enforcing curfews, checking travelers for permission pass, catching those assembling without permission, and preventing any form of organized resistance. Sally Haddon, in her book, Slave Patrols, Law and Violence in Virginia and the Carolinas writes, the history of police work in the South grows out of this early fascination by white patrollers with what African-American slaves were doing. Most law enforcement was, by definition, white patrolmen watching, catching, or beating black slaves. Before undertaking their civic duty, slave patrollers in some places took an oath. The following is an example of one such oath. I, patroller's name, do swear that I will, as searcher for guns, swords, and other weapons among the slaves in my district, faithfully, and as privately as I can, discharge the trust reposed in me as the law directs to the best of my power, so help me God. That was a slave patroller's oath in North Carolina in the year 1828. As we ponder this painful history, let us not only think of the enslaved black person and the grave evil done to their persons, let us also think of the larger white society that also harmed themselves. What damage was done to their minds, hearts, and souls by a society that instituted such demonic values and practices? 
How many slavers were the first men to abandon their black children to the auction block for profit? How could centuries of this evil not morally hobble society? When we do the exact opposite of what God planned, we cannot expect to remain unscathed. Pope St. John Paul II exhorted in his 1994 letter on the third millennium, the church should become more fully conscious of the sinfulness of her children, recalling all those times in history when they departed from the spirit of Christ and his gospel, and instead of offering to the world the witness of a life inspired by the values of faith, indulged in ways of thinking and acting which were truly forms of counter-witness and scandal. He reminded us that we must purify ourselves of past sins and instances of infidelity, inconsistency, indifference, and reluctance to address injustice. Suffice it to say, slavery has shaped all of us politically, economically, socially, and culturally. The uncritical and irrational acceptance of white superiority and conversely, black inferiority permeates our society. The accumulation and concentration of innumerable personal sins and the persistent resistance to make amends or to even acknowledge structures of sin make it difficult to wring out the drench of evil. But as believers, we must be committed to repentance and conversion. In the Jubilee year on March 12, 2000, during a solemn mass at St. Peter's Basilica, Pope John Paul II asked pardon for the sins that members of the church committed throughout the centuries. After enumerating various sins, the Holy Father turned his attention specifically to the sin of racism and offered this prayer. Lord God, our Father, you created the human being, man and woman, in your image and likeness, and you willed the diversity of peoples within the unity of the human family. At times, however, the equality of your sons and daughters has not been acknowledged, and Christians have been guilty of attitudes of rejection and exclusion, consenting to acts of discrimination on the basis of racial and ethnic difference. Forgive us, and grant us the grace to heal the wounds still present in your community on account of sin, so that we will all feel ourselves to be your sons and daughters. This was not the first time that Pope John Paul II had spoken on the evils of racism. In 1985, he asked forgiveness of the African people for the evil of the slave trade. In 1992, on a visit to the House of Slaves on the island of Goree in Senegal, John Paul II noted that he desired to make an act of expiation for the injustice and cruelty suffered by the African slaves. What lingering effects do all of these evils bring to us today? Is it realistic to think emancipation would cause such ingrained behaviors, attitudes, and practices to dissipate? Without sustained spiritual effort, could a wave of conversion of the heart and purification of society have happened? In the next lesson of this course, we will investigate whether the effects of racism were eradicated after emancipation and how freed Black people fared in society.